Shalom. Shalom. Very well. Very good to be here. First time in Nashville, Tennessee. I hear you guys have some awesome music. I just heard it. Well, are you from Nashville? Yeah. I haven't heard it then. There you go. So, good to be here, coming from Israel, long flight through San Francisco, 16 hours flight, you know, like a sardine. Not, go not gonna do that again, but I will, I will. You know, guys, up until a few years ago, Jewish Israelis, like myself, coming to know Yeshua, Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, as our Messiah, used to be an extremely rare product. Actually, 70 years ago, in 1948, with the reestablishment of the state of Israel, all over Israel, you had only 30 Jewish believers in Jesus. That's it. Can I call him Yeshua and everybody understands? Yeah. Okay, it's just more comfortable for me. Thank you. Now, in the last three, four, five years, we are actually seeing a dramatic change in numbers. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Our ministry is doing a lot of things, but I will concentrate on mainly Jewish evangelism. And also, I'll talk to you a little bit about what we do with Arab and Jews together. But first, I want to share with you a three minutes short video, kind of an over overview of what we do in Israel. Let's see if the remote works. Over the last 70 years, Israelis have been at the center of the struggle, hungry for meaning, asking questions and searching for answers. Many find joy in the comfort of the world, while others drown in the sorrow of disappointment. But some have found the answer in one name, Jesus, or as we call him in Hebrew, Yeshua. One for Israel is an initiative of native-born Israelis who are on the forefront of high-tech evangelism, bringing salvation to Israel, raising up leaders and equipping them with the tools they need to transform their communities. And with an emphasis on winning souls, building disciples and sending leaders, we promote the Kingdom of God to both Jews and Arabs throughout the land of Israel. Our Bible College has now grown into a certified educational institution offering bachelor's and master's degree programs, bringing Jews and Arabs together in the classroom and experiencing peace and unity in the name of Yeshua. From our campus, located in central Israel, we work together to proclaim the gospel of the Messiah through websites, a radio station, a television studio, classroom instruction, and the largest Christian library in Israel. Training, equipping, and providing a platform for the gospel to go forth. Also in partnership with local authorities, we provide humanitarian aid to Holocaust survivors, caring for each and every generation with the love of Yeshua. Israel has always been on the cutting edge of internet technology and with more Israelis online per capita than even the United States, Israel continues to be ripe for evangelism on the digital frontier. Igod, Messiah, Isaiah 53, X Rabbi, and I Met Messiah, among others, are all tools and outlets provided by One for Israel so the Jewish people can hear, receive, and grow in the knowledge of the Messiah. We want to promote the message of the gospel in the land of Israel through the cooperation of Christians worldwide. Together, we can care for, educate, and reach out to both Jews and Arabs in the land of Israel. As a native-born Israeli, who has experienced firsthand the transforming power of the Gospel of the Messiah, I would like to invite you personally to extend a helping hand and become one for Israel. Thank you. That was my boss, and now on the screen is my other boss. Just one of them. 
And you can pray for our family, and later on you'll find out um, why. So, you know, God really blessed me um, because he allows me to um, use my two greatest passions in life and combine them together and do what I do today. One of them is, um, I guess you call it theology or the Bible, taking biblical concepts that are not easy for Israelis to understand, um, such as the gospel, and kind of boiling it down to ways that they can understand it and accept it. And I'm actually working on my uh, doctorate right now. And my other passion in life is media. And that's also my professional background. I used to work for advertisement companies and doing all that you do in media. <clears throat> and that makes me today the guy who is heading um, everything having to do with media, evangelism, apologetics as well, with One for Israel. Now, I would like to take you um, into a little journey. So please imagine with me a Jewish Israeli teenager, and let's say that he is 15 years old, and he never left Israel on his own before. But because his parents decided to split up and get divorced, he found himself spending six weeks away from Israel on the other side of the world in Canada. That teenager spent two of the six weeks with a Christian Canadian family, and one day they told him that they are taking him to something called a Bible camp. <laughs> and so he found himself sitting in this yellow school bus that he only saw in the movies up to that point, and he was pretty sad, he was actually miserable, and he missed home like crazy. So he called his dad and he said, Dad, can I please, please come back home already? And his dad said, not quite yet. We are working on it, but soon enough. Now, you need to understand something. Coming from Israel, growing up Jewish, you know, the kind of thoughts that this teenager had in, in the back of his mind was that because he is a Jew, then he is better and more important than the Gentiles. Because he is a Jew, he's part of the chosen people, which means that he's got a saved seat in heaven. And things like sin and salvation, you know, pfft, he doesn't have to worry about it. That's for the Gentiles. But right there, in the middle of nowhere, on the other side of the world, in Canada, surrounded by Gentiles, he got to witness something that he never saw before. Gentiles who sing songs to his God. Gentiles who read his Bible, his history. Gentiles who pray to his God. Not from a book that somebody else wrote telling him how to pray and what to say, but they were praying from their hearts as if God was right there in the room with them. He was jealous at them. You know what happened to him? He was provoked to jealousy Coming back to Israel, he decided he's going to tell nobody that now he's a follower of Yeshua. You know, the end time prophecies and the big last war of Armageddon we are all talking and discussing today. In his mind, the day his Jewish mother will find out that he's a follower of Jesus, <laughs> that's the day it's going to kick off. He was the only believer in his school and the only believer his age in the city. And he felt all alone, which, by the way, was the case for most Jewish Israeli believers back in those days. One day, you know, looking at life, looking how everybody around him wake up in the morning, go to work, come back, watch some television, go to sleep, doing that again and again and again. He came before God and he cried out to God, saying, God, you know, I have nothing to live for in this world. No, nothing is interesting for me. So unless you've got some kind of a big and great plan for my life, then please just take me away from this world. As some of you probably guessed by now, that teenager, that teenager was me 17 years ago. Some of you... Amen. 
some of you guys are probably wondering now, what do you mean 17 years ago? You look 17 now. <laughs> some other ones are wondering, what do you mean Israeli? You sound French. <laughs> I know. But today the situation is very different because we are no longer 30. We actually just did a count a couple of months ago. And in Israel today, you have 30,000 Jewish believers in Yeshua. <laughs> okay, let's jump together 2,600 years back to the time of Ezekiel. Anybody read Ezekiel lately? I bet a lot of you guys, yeah. So I want to read to you a little portion out of Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 24 to 26. I'm sure all of you read it before. It's God's prophecy over Israel through Isaiah, through uh, Ezekiel. And I'm reading, For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and, I will, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And then in the following chapter, we've got the very famous uh, chapter, Vision of the Valley of Dry Bones. Now, we've got two visions there representing two stages. God tells Ezekiel, Ezekiel, prophesy. What do you see? Ezekiel then sees many dry bones coming together and then flesh comes on them. However, they are still dead. Then God is asking Ezekiel, Ezekiel, prophesy again. Now what do you see? Then Ezekiel says that he sees the Spirit of God coming down from the heavens on them and they turn into a big, huge, living army. We have two stages. First is a physical one where God is collecting the people of Israel back to the land of Israel. However, we are still spiritually dead. In 2013, for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the um, Jewish agency came out with, with a very interesting statistics saying that there are more Jewish people living inside Israel than in the rest of the world combined. So talking about prophecies unfolding in front of our eyes. And by the way, it's not because we are so awesome and strong, it's only because God is faithful to his promises. So, you know, you, you get to see the word Israel thousands of times across the, the scriptures. It's never really about us, Israel. It's always about the God of Israel. But, you know, we have a little issue. For 2,000 years, many inside the church didn't really know what to do with this concept of Israel. After all, you know, it makes a little bit of sense. If you think about it, a nation without a language, you know, the, the Hebrew, lingu Hebrew language died. A, 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 a nation with, with no land, you know, scattered all over the world, basically a nation with no hope. You know, any other nation, and that's what history teaches us, disappears within three generations in this situation. So, you know, some came up with this new idea, as we've mentioned before, replacement theology. Basically saying that, you know, 2,000 years, nothing is going on with Israel, Probably God has changed his mind about Israel and he did away with Israel. However, I found one, one tiny, small, little problem with replacement theology. Scriptures. <laughs> so, you know, in Romans chapter 11, verse 1, Paul, Paul is asking a question. I asked them, did God reject his people? And like a good Jew, Paul is also answering his own question. <laughs> so I was looking at your translations. The NIV says, by no means. The NASB says, may it never be. Now, you know, after you read Paul qu quite a while, you realize that this is a very emotional answer coming from Paul. 
Why? Because if God changed his mind about the promise he, he gave to Israel, how can I know as a believer that he's not going to change his mind about the promise he gave me for my salvation? No? Now, maybe, or for sure, I'm preaching to the choir here. Maybe you all want to quote, you know, we just heard, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. How many of you are praying for the peace of Jerusalem? Everybody? Now, I believe David's prayer is very important, very important. But, you know, I get to travel the world quite often and get to meet Christians and I always hear them say, I pray for the peace of Jerusalem, Psalm 122. But I never hear anyone quoting to me Paul's prayer in Romans 10.1. My heart's desire and my prayer to God for Israel is for their salvation. So if you want to see peace in our Middle East, real peace, must start from within, coming first from the Prince of Peace. Another very famous verse that I get quite often, everyone likes to quote to me, and we just heard it, I will bless those who bless you. But then there is a question that comes up. What does it exactly mean to bless Israel? How do you bless Israel? Now, here are the top causes that evangelical Christians around the world gives money to in Israel, thinking that they are blessing Israel. Building Jewish synagogues and settlements, helping Jews make Aliyah, immigrate to Israel, supporting the Israeli Defense Force, humanitarian aid, and helping build Holocaust, uh, sorry, hospitals and uh, buying ambulances. Those are all very good causes, right? But can anyone think what cause is missing and should probably be first? Sharing the gospel in Israel. But there is a problem. The Israeli government is not allowing foreign Christian organizations such as Christians United for Israel to share the gospel in Israel. Any kind of organization coming from the outside to Israel have to sign an agreement with the government. You do not speak about Jesus. Okay? We are not foreigners. Nobody can kick us out. I actually, I only have an Israeli passport, so I have nowhere to go. Now, again, don't get me wrong, there is nothing bad or wrong with feeding the poor, you know, but we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we doing? Are we, are we sending Israelis to hell on a full stomach? What, what's the point? So if you want to bless Israel, don't give Israel bread, give Israel the bread of life. Amen? Amen. 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 So if you only remember one thing because of my funny accent or something, one thing to remember is that the best way to bless Israel is with Yeshua. And that is exactly what I wake up in the morning for every day, me and my team. Which leads me to the second stage or prophecy or vision in Ezekiel's um, vision. The spiritual stage, when God finally gives us a new heart and a new spirit. And I believe we are starting to see a little bit of it now. Now, when you think about those dry, dead bones coming alive into an army, consider Romans eleven fifteen. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world or to the Gentiles, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Now, here is the situation, or should I say, problem. In Israel, we have eight and a half million people. 99.7% do not believe that Yeshua is the Messiah. 
stop and think about it. Israel is where the gospel started. Yeshua, Jewish, Israeli, the disciples, Jews, Israelis, everything happened in Israel. You would expect Israel to have the highest amount of born-again believers, not the lowest. What's going on? It doesn't make sense, doesn't it? Here is a short explanation of why are we where we are. Now, in Jewish history, any kind of a spiritual message that you want to bring into the Jewish world, you, it must be first approved by the gatekeepers. Now, back then, we used to call them the Pharisees. Today, we call them the Orthodox rabbis, right? And they rejected the gospel. Now, if you remember, Yeshua is accusing them in Matthew chapter 23, verse 13. Who to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. And the same in Luke 11, 52. Who to you, experts in the law, experts in the law, for you have taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have no, not entered, and you have hindered those who are or were entering. This is quite an accusation. And those doors are being closed for almost 2,000 years now on my people. And the key to knowledge was lost or maybe thrown away. Our Jewish people were revoked access to the gospel by our Jewish leaders, by the rabbis. You know, Judaism is mentally a gated community. Anybody here have Jewish friends? Okay, almost everybody. Have you ever tried to speak to your Jewish friends about the Messiah? It's like there is nobody to talk to, like a wall, like an invisible wall. You know what I mean? Mentally, it's closed. Oh, no, Gentiles, mm, not going to happen. You know, so we have those, those issues. How, how do we, how can we bring the gospel of Yeshua to the Jewish people? Now, in the past, you know, there were some interesting attempts by some inside the church to try and force Yeshua or Jesus on us. Inquisitions, pogroms, blood labels, crusades, even the Holocaust. Some of you might be surprised, but my grandmother was um, captured by the Nazis. She was tortured. They actually pulled her nails from her hands, and they said that's because you killed Jesus. Now, this is, of course, all nonsense. But for us, Jewish people, we have a strong, li strong link and connection between all of those evil things that were done to us in the name of Jesus and Jesus. It goes together hand in hand. Even, even today, you know, when, when us Jews, Israeli, when we look at Christianity, we think, wow, those guys are so pagan. I mean, they believe there are three different gods and that God had sex with another God, went into the living room and had a, the baby son of God. It's like, this is so pagan, you know. They don't understand because that's what was represented to them. So you see the situation we live in? You understand why we have 99.7% unbelievers? On the one hand, we have the Orthodox rabbis rejecting, saying, no, it's not for you. Don't even hear about it. Stay away from it. It's, it's bad luck for you. It's pagan. On the other hand, we have misrepresentation. Let's find another one. Thank you. <laughs> by the church, you know, for 2,000 years, and we are stuck in between. So far, bad news, and here's some good news. Let's start with some good news. I think that we were able to find the, the missing key, the lost key, and it's actually pretty simple. It's Jewish and Arab Israelis explaining the gospel to other Jewish and Arab Israelis in the Hebrew and Arabic language. It's not some, something that comes from outside, foreign, different. It's something that we do with our own people, and we do it by bypassing the gatekeepers. We bypass the Orthodox rabbis. We no longer need their permission or approval. We go straight into their own children's phones now, <laughs> and computers. 
but here is something very important for you to understand. We do not share the blonde, blue eyes, Gentile Jesus who is dead on a Roman Catholic cross for 2,000 years now. We share the Jewish Israeli Messiah, Yeshua, who's not dead, he's alive and he's changing people's lives. I took this picture in the um, old city in Jerusalem, okay? So as you can see, we Israelis, we love our technology. Actually, more than 99% of all Israeli households are connected to high-speed high internet connection. We are number one in the world in the amount of, of time we spend online surfing the web, 60% more than the average here in the United States. For every 100 Israelis, you have 122 computers. Why do we need more than one computer? I have no idea. That's just the way it is. Number one in the world. We spend 70% of the time on our mo mobile phones to surf the web, not to talk to our mothers. You know, if you, if you Jewish mothers, it's just. <laughs> we are second in the world after Taiwan in the amount of smartphones per person in the world. Taiwan manufactures them, we don't. We are number one in the world in using YouTube, watching video clips on YouTube, number one in the world. Also on social networks like Facebook, anyone on Facebook, follow one for Israel ministry, good. So you guys get the idea. When you guys eat and sleep and take a shower, we watch video clips on YouTube. So you get the idea. You, you understand why I'm sharing this with you, right? We found a way to meet Israelis where they are at. No, it's not the synagogue, it's online. And here's how we do it. I'm gonna share with you a few of the ways that we do it. We operate the one and only Christian radio station in Israel. And uh, if you remember the, the bald guy with the big beard, uh, he's operating that, he's in charge of that as uh, Daniel, also known as George, um, <laughs> as he shared earlier, we've got a lot of websites targeting different audiences in the Israeli society. I'll show you one example that most of you probably take for granted. Now, you can see behind me, this is the New Testament. We have a New Testament website. Why do we need a New Testament website? Now, if you wanna buy the New Testament, what do you do? You go into a Barnes and Nobles or an Amazon and, and you buy one, easy. You don't even have to think about it. What do we do? If I'm an Israeli and I walk into the Israeli bookstore and I ask for the New Testament, listen, you can get the book of Koran, you can get any kind of rabbinic Jewish literature, you can, you can find everything, you know, from mysticism to any other kind of idolatry, but there is one book you will not find in the Israeli bookstores, the New Testament. The rabbis are making sure it's not available to us. So it's very basic for us to have a website where people can order it free of charge or download it, read it online, listen to it, watch it even, or install it on their phone. Um, You'll see behind me in a second. Um, not many people know that, but any, anybody recognize the style? I am second. So it was actually a partnership with Tom, um, who, you know, we came to Dallas five years ago and they trained us. I think we took it to a better place, but you know. <laughs> So here's, here's the thing, the rabbis, the Jewish rabbis in Israel and all over the world are saying that you cannot be Jewish and believe in Jesus. Actually, here is a quote from Rabbi Aaron Moss. He says that being a Jew who believes in Jesus, it's an oxymoron like a vegetarian who eats meat. And they would say that as evidence, they would say, look around you, there are no Jews who believe in Yeshua. You know, do you see any? Now, okay, 70 years ago in Israel, that was probably safe to say that, but not today. 
So what we did is we started to produce testimonies in the Hebrew language, also a bit in Arabic, of Jewish and Arab Israelis. We are about, at about 30 of those now. And they are sharing how they, as Jews, came to the conclusion that the Yeshua is indeed the Jewish Messiah. Now, remember we have eight and a half million people in Israel, and in the last three, four years, these testimonies were viewed more than three million times in Israel. Now, amen. And that's after 2,000 years of silence. Nobody speaks about Yeshua, okay? I mean, not only that nobody speaks about Yeshua, the name Yeshua in Hebrew means salvation. So the rabbis took away, took off the last letter, turning his name from Yeshua to Yeshu, and turning it into an acronym, may his name be blotted out and forgotten forever and ever. That's his name in Hebrew, which is not a very Israeli name, Yeshu, nobody names that. Okay, Yeshua, salvation, that's something very Jewish. If you did a survey on the streets of Israel, let's say 10, 15 years ago, asking 100 Israelis, have you ever met or saw or heard of a Jewish believer in Yeshua here in Israel? Out of the 100, probably 95 or more percent would say, of course not, it's an oxymoron, it doesn't make sense. If you did today the same kind of survey, you'll probably get, get the same amount, same numbers, but upside down. And that is because of those testimonies as, and some other videos I'll share with you soon. I wanna show you a, about a one minute video that kind of uh, tells that story. להיות מוחשב כאחד משונאי ישראל זה מצב מאוד מאוד לא נעים. ובאיזשהו שלב נורא פחדתי מהזהות של עצמי. מה יקרה? מה יגידו ההורים שלי? מה יגידו האחים שלי? לא ידעתי איך אנשים יגיבו. עם ישראל הוא עם קשה עורף. כשאתה מאמין בישוע, אנשים יקללו אותך. קיבלתי איומים על החיים שלי. לקבל יריקה, לקבל דחיפה, לקבל החרמות וכן הלאה. אנחנו הולכים לעשות את הכל כדי שאתה תפסיק להאמין. דחייה, שנאה, איומים. לא רציתי להפסיק להאמין. אבא שלי התחיל להרביץ לי. קיבלתי מכות. רק בגלל שאני מאמין בישוע. אסור לי לדבר על זה. ולכן האינסטינקט הוא להסתיר את זה. אף אחד לא צריך לדעת על זה. התביישתי בזה. זאת האמת. איך זה שעם שלם הולך אחרי הוראת שקר? האם מנסים להסתיר מאיתנו משהו? אלפיים שנה משקרים לעם שלי. תקשיבו, ישוע. יהודי לחלוטין. הוא חיכה אלפיים שנה. ישוע הוא אל שדי. הוא משלנו. הוא המשיח היהודי. הוא מת בשביל כולנו. ישוע קפץ למים להוציא אותי. הוא נתן לי חיים במוות שלו. איך אפשר לא לתת את החיים שלך בשביל מישהו שעשה דבר כזה בשבילך? אין מצב שאני אגיד לזה לא. האהבה הזאת. אהבה מושלמת. אנשים זקוקים לישוע. איך אני יכול לשמור כזה דבר בסוד? אני יהודי שמאמין בישוע המשיח. כבר לא חיפשתי להסתתר. אני לא יכולה להתכחש בתוך תוכי. והחלטתי פשוט ללכת אחריו. אין יותר אמיתי מזה עכשיו, כבר כל המדינה יודעים על זה. הרגשתי חופשי, ממש חופשי וקל. Another project that we have is called uh, I Met Messiah, and those are Jewish people in the English language who came to know Yeshua, Jesus as their Messiah. Now, you know, if you know Judaism, you know that, let me, let me say it a different way. My mother always told me that I can do whatever I want when I grow up, as long as it's a doctor or a lawyer. <laughs> you know, in, in Judaism, education and, and all of that, you have to be something, you know? Otherwise, everyone looks down at you. So we decided, let's look to some, you know, good, you know, successful, professional, 
um, business people and lawyers and doctors, et cetera, et cetera, and produce their, their stories, their testimonies. Actually, one of them was Tom right here. <laughs> Don't turn red. Now, if I knew, I would put your testimony on. Um, anyone here saw any of those testimonies by any chance? A few of you. Okay, we've got about 70, 80 of them um, on the, uh, online on, the, on our website. And we released the first one about three years ago, okay? And in, in the last three years, we've reached only on Facebook and YouTube, we've, we've reached about 20 million views on them, okay? So you can reach a lot of people through media. You know, how many pamphlets and how many years would I need, you know, to give out leaflets on the streets to get to 20 million? Um, I want to share with you a testimony that is actually not online. It's a testimony that we keep for ourselves because we have two places where we shoot those testimonies and when we duplicated to the other place, we needed to test the lightings and the camera and the lenses and all of that, you know. So I drugged my boss, which you saw previously. I drugged him from his office. I said, just give us two hours, you know, sit, share your testimony and we'll just, we need to test everything. And, and he, you know, it, it came actually pretty good. And, and we said, you know what, let's, let's turn it into a testimony. So it's about five minutes, but it's really gonna give you a, a great insight to what it is to grow up in Israel and become a believer in Yeshua. So five minutes, enjoy. How come nobody, nobody told me before? I mean, my family, my neighbors, my friends, my people, nobody knows, nobody tells us. The best kept secret among the Jewish people. I was born to a uh, Sephardic Jewish family uh, my family are Babylonian Jews on my mom's side and uh, Sephardic Jews uh, from Spain on my dad's side. My mom would try to drag my brothers and me to synagogue. Maybe it had something to do with our people thousands of years ago. But God was very, very far away. In school, we would study the Old Testament from first grade to 12th grade. We study it as history of our people, as wisdom literature, um, something that one just needs to know being Jewish, but not as the Word of God. After my military service, like a lot of Israelis, I decided to travel the world. Initially in Southeast Asia, a lot of Israelis are going there for the mysticism trail and the uh, drug trail. I wanted to understand what they believe, and so I was exposed to some Hindu and some Buddhist literature. I got to, to realize that there is a spiritual reality but that spiritual reality I saw was very, very scary. It was negative, it was dark, but it was very real. I ended up in Amsterdam, Holland. And I came there with merchandise to sell because I ran out of money. It was there that I've met a group of very enthusiastic young believers in Jesus. And I said, uh, well, I'm Jewish and we don't believe in Jesus. And they said, why? Jesus is Jewish. And I said, I'm not sure why but I'm sure we don't believe in Jesus. As I got to know them, I noticed two things that really drew my attention and made me curious. One was what they called personal relationship with God. I couldn't understand it. I mean, I could see it. I could see how it works out in their lives. They would pray for one another. They would talk to God like one talks to a friend. Um, it's very foreign to a Jewish mindset. So this friend said, well, would you like to pray? I said, I don't know how to pray. You know, in my bar mitzvah, they gave me a page, I read it. Uh, give me a page, I'll, I'll read it. And the second thing that was even more shocking than that was that some of them were familiar with passages in the Hebrew scriptures that I wasn't very well familiar with. In school, we would study certain chapters and we would skip over a lot of the a lot of other passages, but they referred me to passages that they called prophetic or messianic that talk about the Messiah. And I was amazed. I said, well, how come you guys know the, the Hebrew scripture? I mean, this is ours. And they said, no, it's, it's the whole Bible is one book. And I said, well, I, I have a Bible at home and I've never seen the New Testament. I decided to check it out. So I read the Hebrew scriptures 
and I saw that it was the same one as we had. I had one in Hebrew. And those passages were right in there, telling when the Messiah will be born, what will he do, how are we going to recognize him. Reading this, I became very curious. And I said to myself, I have to read the New Testament. So I actually got one in Hebrew. And every morning, I would kind of look at it and then look away, go about doing my things. Finally, I, I said to myself, well, Eris, you're a hypocrite because you would read Hindu writings and Buddhist writings and whatever. But when it comes to Jesus, you know, you avoid. And I started reading. I was very surprised. First of all, it took place in Israel, in places I've been to many, many times. Growing up in Israel, I've never ever heard anything about Jesus of Nazareth. I've never met a Christian person. I've never seen a New Testament. I had absolutely no idea what it meant. It is particularly ridiculous because I had first degree family living uh, on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And throughout my childhood, we would visit them several times a year, swim, fish. But I had no idea that Jesus or his disciples, you know, ever existed. We refer to this phenomenon as Jesus being the best kept secret among the Jewish people. I, as I read about all the religious institutions, they're still very much with us among the Jewish people to this day. But Yeshua was different. I felt very drawn to him. He, he did not try to do things to win men's favor. And so I started a process of comparing the prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures about the Messiah and how we're going to recognize him and the fulfillment in Yeshua in the New Testament. And to my amazement, it matched. I became convinced, first in my head, then in my heart, that Yeshua is indeed the promised Messiah of our people. Shortly after that, I started noticing changes in myself. I had a great hunger to read the Word of God, the Hebrew Scriptures, and the New Testament. So thinking that I am the first Jewish person since the time of Paul the Apostle, whom I read about in the New Testament, I felt that God is calling me to go back to Israel and tell my family, tell my friends, tell my neighbors, my people, and everybody else that I meet about this great discovery that Yeshua is not just the Messiah of the Gentiles, he's also our Messiah. After becoming a follower of Yeshua, I became overwhelmed with a sense of joy on the one hand, but also urgency because I said, how come nobody, nobody told me before? I mean, my family, my neighbors, my friends, my people, nobody knows, nobody tells us. And I felt very strongly that I need to go and tell my people. I decided to surprise my family. My dad was there and I told them that I believe in Yeshua, the Messiah. The consensus was that in some way or fashion, I've lost my mind. My dad's family, they have uh, arranged for me a meeting with a chief psychiatrist in our city. And he actually formally declared me to be sane. I should have asked for that in writing. My mom's family arranged for me a meeting with a rabbi. And the rabbi promised my mom that he would prove to me that Yeshua is not the Messiah. The day before our meeting, the rabbi called my mom and he canceled the meeting. To my great joy, I discovered there were other believers. I discovered there was a congregation of Jewish believers and I started going there. And so I told them, I want to study the Word of God. Is there any Bible school or Bible college or something like that I can go and invest some time and just study the Bible? And they said, well, no, there's nothing. And I completed my doctoral studies in the United States. After that, with my wife and young children, we came back to Israel. I knew that God has called me to serve him, but I didn't know exactly where. I remember very vividly how it felt coming to know Yeshua and having a deep desire to study the scriptures and not knowing how to do it. And I felt very strongly that I need to go and provide this opportunity for Israeli believers, both Jewish and Arab, to study the Word of God in Hebrew right where it happened. And to that, I dedicate my life.
Those are good, right? Yeah, so go online and watch the other 100 or so. 20 million views on them. It's really changing Jewish evangelism. Uh, and here is another um, behind me. You can, you can read me while I speak the kind of things that the rabbis are saying. Um, another big thing that we do, and this is in Hebrew, so I'm not going to show you anything, but I'll explain. Um, we call it Jewish apologetics. You know, you guys have apologetics like William Lane Craig's and John Lennox and those kind of guys, Revi Zechariah, you know, talking about science and philosophy. We love that, but we also have Jewish apologetics. And it's like, you know, the examples I shared with you earlier. Really, you guys believe in three different gods or God, have a son, how does that work? Or how can you believe in Jesus considering the Crusades and Inquisition, pogroms and yada, 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 all those kind of questions. So, um, you know, ever, so, ever since we started with the testimonies, the Orthodox, re, Orthodox rabbis, after having 2,000 years of peace and quiet, all of a sudden everybody speaks about Jesus this, Yeshua that, drives them crazy. So they started producing their own videos and, you know, they have their own books and booklets and it's like Billy Graham crusades, so they have their own crusades filling out conferences, and basically what they do is speak against Islam, which is fine with me, and against Christianity or Yeshua, trying to prove that, you know, the prophecies in the Old Testament, pff, they don't talk about Yeshua at all, and this and that, and trying to show contradictions in the New Testament, and we do the exact opposite. We teach the prophecies in the Old Testament, so we kind of fight against each other politely, and everyone is watching. What we decided to do in the last three years is to basically find all the Orthodox rabbis who speak against Yeshua in the New Testament, quote their objection, show the objection or quote it, and then answer the objection. Very short, and we came out with between 100 and 150 of those short videos, answering all of their objections and also teaching the Old Testament prophecies. And this drives them crazy because, you know, you know how in the Catholic Church, for example, you'll never see a Catholic person speaking against the Pope on theology because he's the Pope, he's the authority, you don't debate the Pope. So in Israel, we, we don't have one Pope, we've got thousands of them. So after 2,000 years of peace and quiet, not only that somebody does oppose the rabbis, we, but we do it in the name of Yeshua, whom they hate the most. So um, with those videos, we reached in the last three years about 8 million views, okay, maybe 9 million views. And again, it's a country of 8.5 million people. And we started to see Israelis, mainly Jewish people, coming to know the Lord like never, ever before, on a daily basis. <laughs> Amen. So, you know, I used to be on staff with Campus Crusade for Christ, love this organization, and we, we would go on campuses every day for two years, like six or seven of us, trying to beg people to give us five minutes of their time so we can try and explain the gospel to them. If one person came to know the Lord in a year, we would open a champagne, man, you know? <laughs> Today, we don't chase anybody. They actually come to us because of the videos and on a daily basis. Actually, every two hours, somebody is getting in touch with us on average, okay? That's nothing, anything like that that we, we've witnessed as Jewish believers before. With the success comes also persecution. As you can imagine, we get all those different death threats all the time, phone calls. Um, you know, I actually had to move because they found out where we live and they would throw, actually one day they threw this, one, one morning we wake up and my wife tells me, look at the backyard, what is this huge bag? And I look at it and I send my dog out. <laughs> praying is not going to blow up. Um, it was a bag full of feces. Um, kind of, you know, in, in the Jewish Talmud, it says that Yeshua and all of his followers are going to be uh, punished in hell being boiled in feces. 
So that's kind of the reminder to us. So you know, I have, you saw I have a five years old son, he's playing in the backyard, I, I don't need that. Who, who knows what next they're gonna throw. So we decided to move to the 18th floor, nobody can throw anything, unless they have a drone. They found out again where we live, and this time they decided uh, on a new tactic. They printed flyers with our face and address and everything on it, basically warning everybody against us that we are evil and this and that, and basically gave it all over the neighborhood to everybody against us. It's okay, nobody crucified us upside down, not bad. Um, and then they decided to fix my car um, and sending me text messages. If you don't promise right now, you'll stop this. Tomorrow you'll find your wife and son dead on the floor. Stuff like that. Um, so, f so far it's mainly talking, but... Now, I'm not asking you to pray against persecution. Um, it's actually good, in a sense. It shows us that we are doing the right thing. Uh, but you can pray for our protection but mainly pray for the salvation of those people in Israel as a whole. Now, I know that this can, can cause a lot of bitterness, maybe hatred against the Orthodox rabbis, and that is besides my point. This is not the point. Um, we, we actually love them, and you know what? I would give my life to see them getting saved. So don't be bitter against them. Don't hate them. Pray for them. Now, another something big, um, if you look around me, nope, yep, see that the girl there, you know, the Rambam, the Maimonides, you know, one of the Jewish sages in the Talmud, he says that um, a woman, no, a husband should not allow his woman to leave the house, his wife to leave the house more than once, maybe twice a month if needed. Basically, if you're a woman in Judaism, you're a princess, but you know, you need to be in the kitchen, in the corner, in the dark. You'll never see women talking about God with other men. You don't do that about, about the scriptures. They're not allowed to speak about the scriptures with men. And all of a sudden, you've got those Israelis, Jews, speaking about the scriptures, teaching the scriptures, and one of them is actually a woman. That's a big deal in Judaism. That touches the hearts of many and a lot of women as well. And this whole situation led to very, two very interesting things. Not only that the rabbis are after us, but now also the main news channels in Israel found out about us. They are covering us. And it comes to a point where every time we walk in the street, gas station, restaurant, everywhere we go, people recognize us all the time. So far, nobody punched us in the face. Here is another project that we, are, we just started, actually. And it's also thanks to Tom, <laughs> because it's a friend of Tom. Um, her name, actually, I should not say her name. Um, I'm going to show you this new project. We released the first video about three, four weeks ago. Can't remember. We've got two million views on it. It's very powerful. It's also about five minutes. And Let's watch it, and if we can lift up the volume, she speaks very, very slow, very slow. A crowd started to gather. The men were chanting in Arabic. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. And my father and I, as I was holding his hand, were pushed to the front of this crowd. In the center of this crowd was the Arabic woman dressed just like this, and she was tied up and she was sitting on a box. Next to her was the Arabic man, and he did a traditional Islamic prayer on the floor. And he got up from the floor, and from his side, he pulled out this very long golden sword, and he beheaded the woman. My legs are shaking, and my heart is going fast. And my father said, if you don't listen to the teachings we're instilling in your life, this will happen to you one day. I was born and raised in a small country by the name of Kuwait, a community of 98% Muslim population. Two of my uncles are imams, and one is president of a mosque. 
where I would hear the call to prayer five times a day. As a Muslim, the word Yahudi, which means Jew, was instilled in me as a bad word, as a cuss word. Yahudis should not exist. They should be killed. And I never thought to question, why would I hate them? I never met Jewish people in my life. They never did anything to harm my family. I just hated them. Just the word brought hatred in my heart. It's very important to learn the Quran and the Hadith and even memorize it in Arabic. I even entered a competition where you recite a long chapter in front of Islamic leaders and teachers. And I came second place. I thought I did a good job. But my father said, no, that's not good enough. Most of my life for me, it was alone by myself, broken person, in need of love for my family, but I never received it from them. I tried to experience this love from Creator God, from Allah. In my prayer times, I lifted up my hands and I cried out to Allah for help. Please have my father stop beating my mother. Please have my father stop beating me. But no help came. God is not a personable God to Muslims. God doesn't say, I love you. Saddam Hussein horses came in the middle of the night and invaded the small country of Kuwait. And then they came to my city and they destroyed property and they looted people's home and they stole possessions and they killed the men and they raped the women. Then we were granted asylum status to stay in the US. My grandmother suddenly got very sick. She had a heart attack and she went to the hospital. And two days later, she passed away. I was devastated because I lost my best friend. And this lady approached me and asked me if I was okay. And I said, no, Paula, my grandmother died. And I just started to cry again. At that moment, I was hurting so much. Only crying helped. And Paula came to me and put her arms around me. And she gave me a hug. And then she asked me a question. Would you like to go to church with me? When I walked into this church, I experienced love from these people and acceptance from these people like I've never before. Fellowshipping together, they were men and women together. They didn't have to be separate. No one was judging each other. And they knew I was Muslim. They were so friendly to me themselves, accepting of me and loving of me. And that was really surprising to me. And for the first time in my life, I heard a message from the Bible. He started reading the message about Yeshua. When he walked into the synagogue, he was given a scroll from Prophet Isaiah, and he opened the scroll, and he started reading that scripture. That the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the broken heart, and to proclaim liberty to the captive, and freedom of sight to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor first time I heard these words of freedom and healing and liberty. I'm desperate to be freed from bondage. I was held captive in Islam and I wanted to be freed from that. I was blinded with so much hatred in my heart. The darkness broke from my eyes. The veil came off my heart. I knew the decision I was making to leave Islam is a big decision. By Sharia law, Islamic law, it is death penalty. But I'm desperate to know a living God. And that day, I gave my life to becoming a follower of Jesus. This is the God of Israel, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the nation of Israel is God's heartbeat. And I said, God, forgive me. I did not know I hated your people. I love the Jewish people because it's their God, their Messiah that I'm following and he told me to love them. I never knew what happened to the six million Jews that died. I never heard that in Kuwait in history. Now that I met Holocaust survivors, I know their story and I shared my story with them. Your God, your Messiah changed my heart, giving his life for me so I can have life everlasting. He rescued me. He saved me. He came and brought joy in my life again. And I'm a blessed woman. And I start crying, and they start crying. And we are able to relate to each other, and they 
embrace me and they love me and they experience some healing, I believe, when they hear my story. It is a privilege to have that in my life. I am one for Israel. We also started doing videos in Arabic um, and pushing them in the Gaza Strip in the West Bank. And Muslims are starting to come to know the Lord online as well. And here are the first four Muslims in Gaza Strip and West Bank that came to know the Lord. Check out their names. Muhammad, Jihad, Osama, and Sultan. <laughs> I, Very iconic, isn't it? Very iconic. Okay, I shared with you about um, the evangelistic work that we do. I want to say just a few words about the Bible college because it's a very unique Bible college. Not only it's the only Hebrew-speaking Bible college in the world and the only Bible college for Christians in Israel, but, you know, we have two kinds of students. One of them, I guess, you know, you can see um, just young students like everybody else you can see behind me or not <laughs> and but the other kind is much more interesting okay look at them very carefully <laughs> look at those clowns so here in the united states if you want to become a pastor what do you do you go to bible college seminary and you become a pastor in israel it's the other way around you start sharing the gospel with people around you, they come to know the Lord, all of a sudden you look back and you realize, wait a minute, I think I'm a pastor. <laughs> and you don't exactly always know what you're doing and a lot of them don't have any kind of training. So we created a program for those pastors. Now, you never mix Jews and Arabs, not even in the Messiah. You know, I told you I used to be with Campus Crusade. And you've got, everywhere in the world, you have Campus Crusade, Italy, Campus Crusade, United States, whatever, right? In Israel, you have two Campus Crusade, Israel. One for the Jews, one for the Arabs, don't mix. And when I asked back then, why don't we mix? Well, you know, Jews and Arabs, you guys don't exactly play well together, so it's better we don't mix. Interesting answer. Now, my, my boss, my president, he decided, you know what? No such thing as Jews and Arabs, one new man in the Messiah. Let's bring together both Jewish pastors and Arab pastors, put them in the classroom, lock the door and throw away the key, see what happens. <laughs> so we did that exactly. And I bet looking around, looking, looking at the screen, those pastors, I, I don't think you can tell me who is a Jew and who is a Muslim unless you know them. Not a Muslim, an Arab, sorry. Um, I I'm going to show you another short video clip that they are going to be in at explaining their experience and their MA program. But before that, I want to challenge you. You know, we talk a lot about politics, don't we? Not only today, but all the time. My challenge is that peace in the Middle East is not going to come via, via um, geopolitical solutions. Okay, it's, it's, it's only going to happen at the feet of the cause. Um, if the problem of the Middle East is a spiritual problem, then the solution is also a spiritual solution. It's something that diplomats and politicians will not be able to know anything about. Only through Jesus we can find peace. Okay, enjoy this short video. In 2014, we opened the first cohort of an MA program in pastoral ministry for senior pastors of both Messianic Jewish pastors as well as evangelical Arab pastors serving and studying together. So as I entered the class, my first impression was this is going to be great. 
but it's not going to be easy. Especially I felt that we are fulfilling a prophecy. It's a unique because uh, I never experienced something like that. It's really, it's like heaven on earth. Like half Arab, half Jewish, uh, studying together. <laughs> it was in a way like back to school. Because when you are a student, you are thinking like a student. You are not anymore pastor or whatever. You are a student. So as we started to sit, we are <laughs> asking, when is the break? <laughs> we really wanted to create a program where senior pastors, people that are in the trenches, that are giving and giving and giving, and many times don't have a place where they can receive they can come here for one year, get not only training for what they do, but also a place where they can receive encouragement, unity. When I received the call from the ICB, I didn't know, is it a joke or what? As if I have free time by my regular life. I didn't know what to expect being with a group of Messianic and Arab. I, I thought in a certain time we will be maybe uh, arguing, maybe uh, clashing. Who are these people? Are really they believers, believe in the Messiah, believe in Jesus? What will I share with them? And how do they accept me as an Arab pastor? And who, how does I accept them as, you know, Jewish pastors? There was a lot of questions in my mind, you know. How they pray, how they worship, how they teach the Word of God. It's the same like us. Tension that was between Jews and Arabs is very high, so when Jews and Arabs come together and to study God's Word, one of the challenges is to come to a deep unity. But when you put all our guys together, listen, we had fun. Sometimes the teachers had problems to, to calm us down and to be serious. We simply enjoyed sharing jokes, I mean holy jokes, together in the class. To the best of my knowledge, a group like that, studying in a formal academic setting for a whole year, uh, with a very high level of commitment has never ever occurred. For about 20 years I was not in a, in a course. I was challenged if, even as a pastor. At the academic level relate to other uh, colleges, I can say excellent. Even though that I'm preaching already 26 years, I receive a new way. It was a year of education, most important thing. A standard of teaching, a standard of how to approach the Bible a standard of church management. Lecturers that they brought in, I mean, not speaking of Erez and Seth and, and uh, Thomas and all those who came to teach us, but also the professors that have they have invited from abroad to come and teach, was so, um, I mean, was so meaningful. I can always hire a secretary to do the administrative management as an NGO, as the government wants. But as a pastor elder, I'm measured by God by the way I deal with this world. And when the ICB gave me enhancement for this tool, that's what counts in the end of the day before the throne of Christ. It's not the education thing that I got. It's divine appointment. We should act toward knowing everybody, especially as a ministers as a pastors, as a leaders, or the unity of the leaders can move and mobilize and transform the whole Israel. So I would like to close um, with you know, we are like a little startup. You know, Israel is the startup nation. So in a sense, in a spiritual sense, like a ministry, we are like a little startup um, that exploding. Our videos, they've been viewed in the last few years over 55 million times already. Um, and you know, th this is our advantage because we know our own people, we know our own culture, our own mentality. We speak the language. You know, we know how to communicate with our own people. Um, but we have a disadvantage 
we are in Israel, we are disconnected from the world. And this is why I'm so thankful for the invitation to come here and share, because we, we are not this big American ministry. Nobody knows of us, you know. So it's really meaningful uh, to get this invitation. So, so thank you, and thank you all.